got featured in the uh, Chamber newsletter. Did you see that? No, I did not. They put that in there. Uh, there's a new chamber. Oh, God. Yeah, this, is, this month. Chamber newsletter. We have interviews Thursday. Oh, do we? No, I, I, I mean, I went on the committee to that. So I offered to have it. Sean Sally told me that they had they've submitted the five words this week. Hmm. But I haven't heard anything about the new chief. So I don't know. Yeah, I should know. I guess. What if I wait for that thing now? Right. Okay. Uh, yes, I'd like to call the um, uh, St. Charles County Council meeting of January 27th, year 2020, to, uh, to order here. We'll start off with the uh, invocation uh, that will be led by Pastor McNeese from the Redemption Assembly of God uh, of Church of Wentzville, and then it will be followed by the uh, Pledge of Allegiance uh, led by Nancy Snyder. Oh. I didn't study. <laughs> I'd invite you all to bow your heads with me. Our Heavenly Father, tonight I ask you to give help to these proceedings. What greater business is there than to run the very difficult and complicated business of governing this great county of St. Charles? You've prepared the people, the men and the women here to do business. You've given them an education, experience, but there are still things that we cannot possibly foresee. Tonight, help these individuals separate fact from fiction and see through what needs to be done for this county. Your Bible, your word says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And so I'm asking of that of you tonight. Help us to set aside ideologies. Lord, help us tonight to love one another. Help us in this room to work together to the best of our ability for the glory and the wonder of this great county. Let it progress, let it prosper as it has, and may others around the state of Missouri and this nation look upon this great county and see the wonderful work done here. G help these people govern the county tonight, we pray. May every decision be the right decision for the betterment of the people and the betterment of this county. And I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We call the roll. Councilmember Joe Cronin. Here. Councilmember Joe Brazel. Here. Councilmember Mike Elam. Here. Councilmember Terry Hollander. Here. Councilmember Dave Hammond. Here. Councilmember Nancy Schneider. Here. Councilmember John White. Here. Next order of business is public uh, comments. Uh, a reminder of those that uh, uh, speak to fill out a card. Uh, just a reminder that the uh, time limit is three minutes um, and we will accept three pro and three uh, con on each issue. Uh, Claire, you got some names? Charles Williamson. I'll try and keep time on myself. Okay, guys, good evening, uh, council. Uh, I come before you tonight, um, talk about the flooding that's been happening over the years. Most of you have been around for a long time. Steve and everybody else, we know what county takes here. But what's going on right now, Governor Parsons got a committee, and they're supposed to make a final report in May. But this committee is uh, comprised of different groups around the state. And it's also, you know, they're looking at the Missouri River also and all the volume of floods they've had there. But what's going on here, and I've lived out there 50 years. My mom was from Portage and her grandpa and all that. that. That town's been there over 200 years. They've had more floods in the last 20 than they had the previous 200. These aren't made by nature. Uh, what a group that's up there on this committee is Umemra. They represent a lot of the flood districts that are 
or levy districts, I'm sorry, that are up in uh, northern Missouri and Illinois, a couple in Iowa. And the Corps of Engineers has identified these districts as being four to five feet over the top of where the levees are supposed to be. Hydrologists for the Corps have identified this is putting three to five feet of water, every water event, not flood, every water event on Missouri. And guess what? We're on the crosshairs in St. Charles County. We have no levees across the whole northern side of St. Charles that are along that river. We're bare bones to it. Everybody out there has been taking abuse. And I'd like to see this council kind of help and go after uh, these committees or at least a touch, touch base with the uh, governor and said, hey, we'd like a little uh, representation here because they're trying to make an end run, remember, you remember is with the Congress to uh, get Plan H is their original plan. We've been <coughs> fighting that for a long time, but to get that plan uh, set in stone so that their levies, well, they know they're over the limit. They put them over the limit on purpose, but they said, well, we'd like to get these uh, established so we can keep them. And this is, guys, it's gonna be genocide for everybody out there in the floodplain, school district, everybody else. Everything's based off the 93 flood, well, we know it was our big one. But this is a game changer because now the demographics on the Mississippi River and water coming down here is way beyond what they, what they had in 93. They didn't have the levees they have now. There's hundreds of thousands of acres up there. Farm ground, which is no different than ours out here, they're no more important than ours, and they think it is. And we're taking the abuse. And everybody out there, you, Dave, you guys, everybody here knows that we, we, we've been here a long time dealing with this. But we live out there, that's where it is. But we accept that. But when the man-made floods coming at us like this, consistently, every other year, winter floods are unbelievable. You just, you never would have them. I mean, never, I'm an old duck hunter out there, and that cold water is just not any fun anymore. But <laughs> it just makes it miserable for everybody. But they shouldn't be happening in the middle of winter. The, the, the river just doesn't, doesn't work that way. And, uh, you know, I'd like the council maybe to go after and address these folks that are up there on the council and, uh, you know, maybe uh, get something done with them. I'm Thank sorry, Mr. Chairman, oh, I'm over fine. the limit, but I you. appreciate you guys' indulgence on this and, uh, and uh, the citizens out there would really like it. And I'm gonna see a lot of them this weekend, so uh, I know there are gonna be some questions about it. Yeah, Joe? Yes, um, Mr. Turner. Years back, myself and Councilman Doherty, which represented the mm -hmm. St. Charles Bottoms and I represent- Lives in Portage, yep. Right. We went to a lot of the neighbors in the Mississippi meetings. Mm -hmm. We met with Lincoln County Councilman. We met, I think we actually went to one new member meeting too. And the problem is, as you know as well as I do, there's those, those folks that are members of that are typically large scale farmers, Bankers, big money, where this side of the river tends to be smaller parcels of Oh, land. you're right. Okay. So any information you've got, maybe this 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 has been a few years down past but any information you have about this, would you send this to me? And I'd like to take a look at it again and maybe we can get involved up to you a little bit. Have have okay. no problem. It's actually yeah. public record there. Governor Parsons at least looking at this. Maybe I think more of it was because of the Mississippi or the Missouri River flooding through uh, central Missouri. And uh, it's not so much of what was going on in Mississippi. But uh, yeah, I'm more than happy to send that to you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Arnie Dinoff. Thank you very much, members of council. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, <coughs> public advocate and county resident. Are you done? When you're done. Okay. That was very rude. So anyways, Mr. Chairman, my name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, public advocate and resident. And um, a couple of things that I'd like to talk about. First of all, are the consulting services for Smart Field. We just heard about flooding. Smart Field floods every year. Let me repeat myself. Smart Field floods every year. Cost taxpayers for our county millions upon millions of dollars to rehab this airport because of flooding. We either need to get it out of the floodplain or scrap the project. Now you wanna spend $32,000 for another consultant and uh, it's taxpayer, do taxpayer dollars going down the tubes. It's wasteful spending. We spent millions upon millions of this, redoing this airport from the floodwaters. Bill 4811, you want to rename Smart Field to the regional 
which what I call for the rich and wealthy of St. Charles County to fly their toy airplanes or their uh, little uh, hobbies. And so I think it's ridiculous that you want to rename this airport and it's just a waste of taxpayer money overall. Bill number 4812, again, you want to have an emergency airport aid agreement to repair runway lighting system. It's going to be ruined by the floodwaters in the spring of 2020 to the tune of $43,000. And I think we need to look at other options rather than wasting our local, county, and federal funds. Now, before this meeting, I made a request um, to the uh, county executive's office for a public records request. On your agenda is the destruction of records of the county executive. I sent it to Ms. Lycom and Ms. Gibbs and Mr. Elman to my right. I'd like to view the 2012-2013 payroll records, budget requests, credit card authorizations, purchase orders, check requests, and travel authorization before they get destroyed. I think there's some questions here that need to be taken care of and maybe referred to both the county auditor and the state auditor's office for uh, some examination and investigation. Now it's in the past and again tonight I will call for either the resignation or the retirement of Police Chief David Todd. Enough bad leadership in our county. He is a bad leader in my opinion. The rules, the standard operating <coughs> procedures of the county police have been manipulated, violated. There's been racketeering. There's been political uh, 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 endorsements or advancement without following the three-year rules of being in one rank before being considered for another. There's <coughs> dishonesty, sexual harassment of women in the police department, and there's some bad leaders that are allowed to remain in the administration. I'm asking that we do a nationwide search for a police chief. We did it in O'Fallon and we found Chief Tim Clothier, outstanding and excellent. And I ask that this council do a nationwide search to once and for all find a good leader that has 15 years of experience and a master's degree in uh, law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nino. Anyone else, Claire? No more speaker okay. cards. Uh, next up is the consent agenda, or is there any items to be removed from the consent agenda? Mr. Chair, I, I would like to remove for discussion the, the three uh, contracts for professional services just for, for the highway department, just for, to, for brief discussion, please. Yeah, second on that? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that is removed from the consent agenda. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, Mr. Uh, Cronin. Mr. Tukowski, can I ask you a question, please? You know, I read through these a little bit, and I just, my question would be, like, for instance, and I've read through what Chris Bostic said, how you select folks, because mostly RFQs. So, I mean, I, you try to choose, choose the best per person. And I don't know how you balance it. For instance, if the best guy costs 200000 and a guy that's not so good is 100 do you take the 100 do you take the 200 I don't quite understand that. And then, like, for instance, $170,000 for highway and overlay and sidewalk improvements. I mean, if you're laying over asphalt, or I'm assuming, and you have to put new sidewalks in, does it really cost that much? And then the last question I have, a few times I've been out of MoDOT's office at K&N, and I see, looks like they've got engineering staff and maybe some draftsmen in there. This is $650,000, these three contracts. It would, would, be, would be prudent for us to think about, all, maybe you have additional, for $650,000, you could pick up a couple civil engineers and a few draftsmen, I would think. So, I mean, that's the only questions I have, sir. I'm not, I'm not questioning your judgment or anything. I'm just wanting to know how this system works. Okay? I can address the first one. Yes, sir. Um, we are not allowed by state statute to talk about price until after we have selected a firm. Um, we used to do that and we got our hand slapped a little bit and the statutes are very clear now mm -hmm. that you must select a consultant based on their qualifications, on their uh, manpower, on their uh, ability to, ha to handle the workload. Once that cult consultant is selected, then you sit down and you start talking price. And that's a negotiated price. They submit uh, hours and, and fees associated with that. We look at it and say, well, we think you could probably save some time here, cut the fees back a little bit. and Normally, we come to a consensus. If we cannot, then we have to go back to the second qual most qualified consultant and start all over again discussing um, fees at that point with them. So again, there's no guarantee even that it would be less than 
what we ended up with the first one, although you know that would be the goal if we felt mm -hmm. like the other one was too high. So mm -hmm. that's the process that we must follow by state statute. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you, what is the threshold when you look at a project and you say, well, maybe we need to talk to the second bidder too? What's, what's the you process? You can't do that. You have you to, do that. yeah. You want, you, once you pick your favorite, not favorite consultant, but most mm -hmm. qualified consultants, highest scoring consultant, mm -hmm. then you talk money with them and you cannot talk money with anybody else until you've cut off negotiations with that first firm. But just thinking of how the marketplace works, once that company knows that they are the selected, the chosen one, what's to keep them from overcharging you? Okay. Well, I mean, we do, have, we do have the ability to scrutinize, you know, their charges. Okay. Um, unfortunately, this is just how the statutes is written. Um, they're called professional services, and we don't have a lot of a hammer here that we can use. I mean, okay. and these, these firms negotiate in good faith most of the time. I mean, once, okay. once they get a project with us, they'll want to have another one in the future. So mm. the last thing they want to do is give us the impression that they're overcharging us. Okay. And, and so it, it works out fairly well. I mean, it is a lot of money. Mm. Um, there's no doubt about that. And your, your last question was, should we be doing this in-house? Um, I don't know that we have enough projects to hire the engineers, pay for the hardware and software that we would need, and keep all of that functioning uh, 365 days a year. Mm. We would have downtime. We would probably be forced to lay off people. The consultants, of course, they get jobs from all the agencies mm. around private sector. Mm. They can always keep their people busy. Mm. I don't believe that we, can, that we could do that uh, because it takes a lot of hours to do these projects. I mean, a lot of hours. Okay. Uh, so you have to have staff. You have to have hardware, a big, big capital investment. And then what happens if we don't get projects for a while? We've got these people sitting there. We've got this hardware sitting there, and it's not being utilized. Okay, you've done a great job on the roads, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm. What I'm hearing from you is this is a system we got to do it. There's nothing any better. This is but a you, system we're forced to deal with. But well, when we look at the county budget and the shape that it's in, if you see anything that's better, don't hesitate to let us know. But thanks and I for, thought you had one more question. I, did I answer all? That's three pretty of them? much it. But even like an overlay project, do you really have to do that much engineering? Well, for overlay projects? with with that project, it's a little more complicated. Um, the overlay is simple. There's no doubt about that. Unfortunately, on the what I'll call the right-hand side of the road, we're going to be putting in a sidewalk, and the way those yards are graded, back rear yards, we're probably looking at substantial retaining walls that need to go in, and there's a lot of engineering that's involved with retaining walls and changing all the storm sewer structures out in, in order to accommodate that. So even though it looks like a simple project, it's actually a bit more complicated. Is there some type of federal or state mandate to put more sidewalks in? Because I'm seeing ones like, for instance, on the new I-70 uh, Main Street, Highway K uh, project in O'Fallon. They've got sidewalks here big enough you could drive a small car down, okay? Is there some type of new mandate? Because here's, they put all these sidewalks in in these streets and you seldom see people using them. It's, it's, there's it, not a government mandate. There's a, I think, what you would call a public mandate. I mean, people expect us to be doing that now. Okay. When I first started in this business, we couldn't even use county road board money to build sidewalks. That was, we could only build it on the road. But as things have progressed over time and people want to get out and walk and want to get out and ride bikes, they're pretty much forcing us to start including these. And in fact, a lot of the federal money now is tied to whether or not we include sidewalks into our projects. If we did not include the sidewalk on Route N, we would not have got any federal money yeah, to do that yeah. job. The West Terra and Fallon, where all the cement trucks drive, when they widen that up, they hit, they got the money to buy putting a bicycle lane in. But never, never, I drive that all the time, never saw a bicycle on it, but sure is nice for the cars with the cement trucks. But hey, thanks for your time. I appreciate sure it. Sure thing. I'd like put that back on the consent okay. agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, put this back on the consent agenda? Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, next up is bills for final passage, starting with bill number 4809. Uh, bill number 4809, an ordinance authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute a professional services agreement between St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Jefferson County, the Housing Authority of St. Louis County, the City of O'Fallon, and the City of Florissant, and Mosaic Community Planning LLC for analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. <coughs> Okay. Any questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute a professional services agreement between St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Jefferson County, the Housing Authority of St. Louis County, <coughs> the City of O'Fallon, and the City of Florissant, and Mosaic Community Planning, LLC, for analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. 
Council Member Cronin? Yes. Council Member Breisel? Yes. Council Member Elam? Yes. Council Member Hollander? Yes. Council Member Hammond? Yes. Council Member Schneider? Yes. Council Member White? Yes. Okay. Bill number 4809 passes. Uh, next up for final passage is bill number 4810. Bill number 4810, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute the congestion mitigation and air quality CMAQ agreement with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission to grant the use of funds to improve the intersection at Central School Road and St. Peter's Hall Road. Federal Project CMAQ 7302683 for the reimbursement of up to 80% of the eligible costs not to exceed a maximum of $1 million. Any questions or comments on this particular bill? Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute the congestion mitigation and air quality agreement with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission to grant the use of funds to improve <coughs> the intersection at Central School Road and St. Peter's Hall Road, Federal Project CMAQ 7302683, for the reimbursement of up to 80% of the eligible costs not to exceed a maximum of $1 million. Councilmember Breisel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Okay, Bill number 4810 passes. Uh, next up uh, for final passage is Bill number 4811. Bill number 4811, an ordinance to rename the St. Charles County Airport, the St. Charles County Regional Airport Smart Field. Questions Chairman. or comments? Yes. Yeah, I would like to point out, uh, you know, when somebody's going to call themselves a public advocate, they should speak the truth because I know the county airport doesn't flood every year and it has it. So I, I, I have a real problem. If you're going to get up and be a public advocate, you ought to speak the truth. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Crowley. I'd like to echo that. I was a long-term tenant of that airport, and not only does it fl not flood every year, but also not everybody there is a wealthy person, okay? Uh, you can buy a small, most of the planes there cost less than an average pickup truck, and the hangers are, are awfully reasonable. They're a little over $200 a month for somebody to, for hangers. So when you can, you know, anybody that's got a bass boat or bowls or a lot of any other hobby, you can spend just about the same amount of money in some of those hobbies as you do flying. Also, the current directors worked really hard through the flood to get that airport back in shape. And he's basically, this name change is designed to try to, to show this more regional effort that uh, maybe we'll get a little extra business into it. Additionally, a lot of these contracts, like I, the reason I didn't question the contract on the consent agenda is most of those are paid by substantial amount by MoDOT from fuel taxes that those people that are flying those airplanes at Smart Field are paying. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a little that if you have to get some time to go down to the airport, it's a hidden gem for the county and the current airport directors really worked his butt off to make it, make it nice even after that flood. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Please call the roll. An ordinance to rename the St. Charles County Airport the St. Charles County Regional Airport Smart Field. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Bill number 4811 passes. Uh, next bill for final passage is bill number 4812. Bill number 4812, an ordinance authorizing execution of Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission's Emergency Airport Aid Agreement Project AIR 196-111A-1 to repair runway lighting system and replace PAPIs and to accept a grant in the amount of $43,380, which represents 100% of funding available for qualifying expenses. Okay. Questions or comments on bill number 4812? Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance authorizing the execution of Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission's Emergency Airport Aid Agreement Project AIR 196-111A-1 to repair runway lighting system and replace PAPIs and to accept a grant in the amount of $43,380, which represents 100% of funding available for qualifying expenses. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? <clears throat> yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Uh, bill number 4812 passes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, if I recall, when we moved on the consent agenda, the three professional service agreements were pulled off the consent agenda. And when the discussion on those three, the, the consent agenda was adopted, when those discussion ended on those three professional <coughs> service agreements, 
we went on to the bills for final passage. Uh, we never acted on those. They did take yeah. a vote. Yeah, we, yeah, we I did. was yeah, under we the did. impression they did take a vote. Yeah, we did. He asked for a motion to return that to the consent agenda, and it was passed. Councilman Cronin, and then. Yeah, it, oh. we can pass. So, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we um, approve the professional services uh, item that was removed from the consent agenda by Mr. Cronin. Three items. All three. All three. Okay. Have a second on that? Second. second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. All right, next up is bills for introduction. First of all, we have bill number 4813. Bill number 4813, requested by Amanda Brower, sponsored by Council as a whole, an ordinance approving execution of first supplemental cost apportionment agreement with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission, known as the Commission, to coordinate the participation of St. Charles County in the cost of the Commission's public improvement for I-70 <coughs> in St. Charles <coughs> County, which includes mowing and litter pickup along I-70, from the Warren County line to the Missouri River, job number WMSCF, 18Q. Any questions or discussion on bill number 4813? Mr. Cronin. I complained about this and voted against it last year. And afterwards, I got a pretty good chew in from our county transportation lobbyist at the time because it was part of a negotiated agreement with, with uh, MoDOT. The problem I had with it back then is we are actually paying county taxpayers money to pick up trash and mow part of a federal interstate highway that's supposed to be maintained by MoDOT. And we don't pay to have uh, Highway 79 uh, mowed or picked up. We don't pay for Highway 61 or 64. I don't know why this one's different. So if you want me to vote for this next time, I need to find out if this was part of a negotiated agreement like the last one was because I, I did eventually uh, agree with the transportation lobbyists. I even sent out uh, note, note or letters to the MoDOT folks to, so I didn't get them riled up about it, okay? Because, uh, because there was a lot of uh, transportation needs in my district. But that being said, I would like to know a little bit more why we have to spend our money on their road, okay? I understand. Okay. Any other hey, comments? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, I, w I would like to know that too, and, I, and I, I've asked our uh, legislative delegation several times why it is that we spend over the last eight years $90 million on their system. And that's, that's what we have spent, and you all are very much aware of that. And as I've said before, I don't regret any, a dime that we've spent, but how long can we continue to do it? It's the same way with, I mean, they've cut it, they've cut back on the number of times that they, they do the grass, uh, just as they, uh, you know, so, uh, John, I think uh, they were supposed to cut it six times. As it, as it turned out, the weather was too wet. They only cut it five, and we got a, we got a refund for, for whatever it is. I will only say that I remember uh, on one occasion driving back from Columbia or somewhere, <clears throat> and it, it, I did just happen to notice it. The, the grass was very high uh, all the way down until you got to St. Charles County, and they had just cut it. <laughs> And it really looked a whole lot better than, than the rest of I-70. So, um, yeah, I, I wish I wish MoDOT would take care of it, and then we wouldn't have to. Yes, sure. Can I add also that in addition to cutting the grass, it's the litter pickup. And so, I when the question was why I-70, not 79, not 61, I-70 is our most heavily traveled tra corridor. And sometimes what we think is litter is not just plastic bottles, it's pieces of furniture, it's couches, it's tires. And having that picked up four times a season, unless someone complains, is, is really not acceptable on, on such a major corridor. You know, we wish that MoDOT had the manpower and the staff and would do it, but paying for two additional litter pickups is, is pretty critical on a, such a heavily traveled corridor in our, our county. Could, could we not just put a sign up and say the additional rubble along the highway is courtesy of the state legislature not passing an increase in the fuel tax? We could, use a, we could use a sign similar to that, similar wording throughout the county on many, many roads. Uh, this is just one more example of local government being asked to pick up some of the duties that the state normally does. And so picking up litter, cutting the grass, you know, we do a lot of work on the rural routes to make them safer. Um, I, it, unfortunately, the, the state, state legislators get their act together and actually fund transportation in the way they need to. 
you know, how, as County Executive said, how much longer can we afford to do so? We are, we do supplement their system quite a bit. Okay. Any other discussion on this bill? I would yeah. tell Mr. Cronin that both the uh, Greater St. Charles Chamber and the O'Fallon Chamber have a great billboard program where uh, you can actually advertise for uh, 100 bucks on the billboards along 70. So if you decide- I'll spend that honey. I start to say, if you decide that you want to do that, I'm a chamber member, we, we can make and, that and work. The, and so. the governor's coming to town for Lincoln days might be an appropriate time. You know, just throwing that idea out there. The governor supports that fuel tax to go to well, the voters. Since we're on the subject, um, that, that swamp down in Defiance, it's on Highway 94, it's been there for years. Um, I had Donna, we made a sign. We actually made a sign and said, this is a MoDOT problem call your state senator and I put their phone numbers on there, the state, the reps, because everyone was calling me complaining about it. That sign is still on that corner. Everyone reads it. <laughs> <laughs> Problem it's still been there, there about six months. Problem yeah. still there? Well, they got the engineer and then they're going to put it out the bid to fix it. So I may, may put some pressure on them. I don't know. But maybe the sign thing is such a bad idea. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. Yes. Yeah. Just I don't think it was the sign that put the pressure on them. I think there's a councilman that put a lot of pressure, pressure. on them on that particular <laughs> water hole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other discussion on bill number 4813? Okay, seeing none, let's move on to bill number 4814 for introduction. Bill number 4814 requested by Craig Tukowski, sponsored by Terry Hollander, an ordinance authorizing execution of Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission State Block Grant Agreement Amendment number three, Airport Improvement Program Grant, Project 16-111A-1 to extend the project time period to allow for completion of the work for design and construction of apron rehabilitation at Smartfield <coughs> Airport. Any discussion on uh, bill number 4814? Okay, seeing none, that ends the uh, bills for introduction. Uh, are there any table bills to be removed from the table? Okay, seeing none, that uh, brings us to announcements and miscellaneous. Does anyone have someone? Mr. Cronin. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to bring this up now, and I'd like the council and maybe yourself to consider for doing a work session about this. Um, a week ago, Monday, or a week ago today, Post Dispatch uh, headlines was the prison shrink under Parson. And essentially, uh, the gist of the article is there's 7,000 extra capacity at the state prisons due to, to stuff, some of the probation reforms and some of the other things were done. And I think that ties in nicely to what we just got this final report recommendation where the, the fix to our jail because we're running out of room is $93 million, which is money that we don't have and most likely our citizens don't want to spend for a jail. So my thinking is possibly that we consider having a work session and invite some of our judges in to see if there's a way they could educate people quicker so that if they're innocent, they're returned to their, their families, if they're guilty of a minor crime they can be going in a probation pro pro uh, process but if they really uh, need to go uh, to the big house then maybe we can get them in this place faster the county uh, the state prison quicker <coughs> instead of spending 93 million dollars of our taxpayers money on expanding and improving our jail so that being said Ch mr chairman that's your decision to make but i'd like to hear firsthand from uh, some of the judges why they, what we need to do to get these folks through the system quicker. Okay, we'll certainly look into that. Obviously, with the, the jail situation that we have, we, we certainly need uh, answers to some questions and maybe some alternative uh, methods. Thank you. Yes. Could, could I just say from my experience, and I think it's, it's being exacerbated now, you know, we know <laughs> that a lot of the people, in fact, a majority of them over in the jail are awaiting trial. They're more dangerous people who are not out on bond. The problem is those people are entitled to attorneys. Most of those people don't have the funds to hire an attorney, so they go on a waiting list for the public defender, and that's something that I was dealing with a lot during my last term as the presiding judge. The public defender um, did their own study to, as to uh, how, how many cases they should take and what they should how much time they should spend, and they just refuse to, to do any more than what they were doing because they say they were underpaid, and I don't really dispute that because they probably are underpaid, but that's not, that's not the county's problem. So as a result, these people go on a waiting list, and month after month, we bring them over to the courthouse and talk to the public defender and say, you know, when are you going to get this person attorney? 
And that's something that the judges really don't have a lot of control over because you can't force somebody to go to trial without legal representation. But I'm sure they'd be happy to talk with us about it. Okay. And if you want, I could talk to the <coughs> presiding judge and, and kind of let him know, you know the dilemma that we're dealing with and see if there's some way that we could have a meeting or get together or, or uh, get some more information about it. I'd so also, I'd be glad to do you that. You can buy a lot of public defenders for $93 million. That's maybe, true. Maybe there's a way we can do something maybe there. Maybe we should hire our own public defenders with <laughs> some of that money yeah. and send them over there. So, yeah. But I'd be glad to, to try to follow up on that if you'd like me to. Get to Thank uh, you. Okay. You know, uh, start considering a work session and the dates and stuff. We'll, I'll get okay. Get Here, I'll make that call. Okay. okay. Any other uh, announcements, miscellaneous? Motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. Motion is passed. Thank you, folks. That was a fast one.